reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This evening, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of 2 Peter. The second epistle of Peter, chapter 2. The title of the message is, The Christian's Warning. It's interesting that if you were to ask most Christians, what is the one major theme that seems to characterize all of the New Testament uh, writers of the epistles, Paul and John and Jude and Peter and uh, James. We might think, well, Jesus and the blood and salvation, and certainly all of that's in there. But the primary theme uh, really is an important one, and that is watch out for false doctrine. Watch out for false teaching. Once the truth has been given, the devil is going to try to pollute it trying to bring lies. I uh, remember how we found Jesus talking to Peter after the resurrection up by the Sea of Galilee. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes. He said, uh, feed my sheep. And so show your love by feeding my sheep. How do you feed the sheep? Well, fellowship socials and Dunkin' Donuts are nice, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about feeding with the word of God. And I think the most important job for a pastor, um, and uh, as of uh, last week, the elders had um, voted to have Kelly be joining me as co-pastor. She'll be installed this week. Also, Patrick Porterfield will be uh, installed as an elder. And so Kelly's job and my job primarily, counseling is important, uh, staying up at night, crying, laughing, uh, being there in the hospital. We, we, we were at the hospital last night. We're going to have to visit somebody this weekend probably. All that's important. But I think there's nothing more important than defending the Word of God, defending doctrine. You need to know the doctrine, and you need to stand with that doctrine. If not, there is going to be trouble. Years ago, one of the pastors in this church gave me a tract he said, Pastor, I think you ought to read this. I was tired that Sunday, and I went home that night, but I figured I'd better read it. And it had no paragraphs, barely any punctuation. Oh, I hate to read something without any paragraphs. And I waited through it. I said, Holy Spirit, cause it to jump out. This pastor who has recommended to me has over 60 years of experience. He can't quite put his finger on it, but something doesn't quite seem right. Well, this young man who had written this tract was actually, without our permission, holding a Bible study of men in his own home. And the men from our church were going to his fellowship. Nice guy. And I saw very clearly what the Holy Spirit was showing me. And I called him into my office and I said to him, um, you're taking two scriptures uh, out of context. You're taking Romans 10, 9. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you know how the rest of that goes, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. He also said elsewhere to go into all the world and baptize them, uh, and, to, uh, uh, and whoever is baptized will be saved, and whoever is not will be condemned. Um, and so he put the two together. Uh, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and if you are water baptized, you'll be saved. I said, oh, no, no, no. That's known as baptismal regeneration, being born again by the physical act of water baptism. That is not biblical. Water baptism simply evidences the inner reality of our being immersed by faith, by the Holy Spirit, in the body of Christ. And I asked if he would be able to uh, relent from that, and he said, no, I can't. I think that's scriptural. They have to be baptized in water or they're not saved. 
I said, well, too bad for the thief on the cross. He didn't quite have a chance to get down and, and do that. Uh, I said, that's works. Nope, he wasn't going to give it. So I said, well, I can't have you teaching anymore. So he decided to leave and uh, moved out to California. Nice guy. I hear from him now and then. Nice guy. But I had to take that stand. I lost a family of tithers, family of maybe six, seven people, a lot of kids. A uh, lovely family, but you've got to be strong and watch out for false teaching. Well, tonight we're going to look at false teaching. Peter warns us against false teachers and their sinful ways. The doctrine of false teachers, first of all, is verses 1 to 3. Then the doom of false teachers. Then there's the description of false teachers. And then there's the deception of false teachers. So we're going to look at the D's. Doctrine, doom, description, and deception. And I think the lesson here in chapter 2 is to avoid false teachers, look to Jesus and his word. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the word of God. My mother, when she first came to the Lord, had not had a chance to read a lot of scripture, but she was attuned to the Holy Spirit, and he would indicate to her when she listened to a teacher, something's wrong. And she learned quickly to say, uh, demand chapter and verse. You don't just get up there and make some doctrine. Give me chapter and verse. Where does it say that? And uh, a lot of these teachers will just simply, not a lot, but some will just simply talk away without any uh, evidence of it at all. When I was a lawyer, I learned as I was being trained for the law uh, and then practice law, that when you go into court and you have a brief and you present your case and you make your statement of what the law is, you need to have a citation. It says in New York State, book so-and-so, page so-and-so, this is the law, or the federal law. You have to have a citation. The judge is going to say, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you want. Show me the precedent in this state that supports your position. So with teaching. Show us in chapter and verse what you're saying. Well, let's go on and talk about uh, uh, the doctrine of false teachers. First of all, we see in verse 1, they deny Jesus. Secondly, they blaspheme the truth. And thirdly, they exploit believers. They're out for money. They're out for gain. So as far as my friend is concerned here, you could argue, well, Jerry, he wasn't denying Jesus. And I could say, well, he loved the Lord, but Jesus was not the same Jesus that I serve. My Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, it's finished. Jerry, you don't need to get water baptized. It won't do any good at all for your salvation. It'll be good for your obedience, your faithfulness, as a testimony to others. But this is an incomplete Jesus who needs to have water baptism to complete his work. It's a different Jesus. Um, and that's blaspheming the truth. The truth is he did all that was necessary. We have to just simply believe it by faith. In any event, let's not talk about that one, gentlemen. I'm hoping he'll be enlightened. But let's look now at verses 1 through 3, the doctrine of false teachers. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. So they have destructive doctrines. They First of all, in verse 1, they deny Jesus. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Among means they're going to grow up in your congregation. They'll be sitting in the pew, working from the pulpit. They'll be false teachers. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, bought them with his own precious blood. And they'll bring on themselves swift destruction. Now, my early training was not as a Christian, but as a Christian scientist. And I had gone through a lot of training uh, and actually had become equipped to become a professional Christian science practitioner up through the age of 21. And I was taught in Christian science that Jesus was a man, a perfect man, but he wasn't God. And he didn't really die in the tomb. 
another scripture that was another statement that was made by the author of the textbook, Mary Baker Eddy, was that sin is too awful for anyone to atone for anyone else. And the blood of Jesus, when it was shed on the cross, was no more powerful to cleanse from sin than when it flowed through his veins. Is that destructive heresy? That is destructive heresy to be sure. And we're talking about those kinds of doctrines. That's not the same Jesus. That's not the same Jesus. Well, many will follow their destructive ways. Christian science was very popular, still is in some areas, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The truth is, Jesus is our Savior. He has shed his blood for our sins, and all we need for our salvation is to believe him, trust in him, and receive him as our Lord and Savior. And then once we've done that, yes, we get water baptized to tell our friends, I'm going to give you a picture as I go beneath the water of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and my death, burial, and resurrection into newness of life and my identification with Christ. So water baptism is important, but it does not save us. Well, they usually have money as their motive. Verse 3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. They're very clever. They're very silver-tongued. They're very motivational. Uh, for a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. So uh, they're using deceptive words to try to lead you astray into a life of damnation and condemnation, and God is preparing a judgment for them. He is not idle. He hasn't forgotten about them. Their time will come. So that's the doctrine of false teachers. Number one, that they deny Jesus. Number two, they blaspheme the truth. And number three, they exploit believers, and always trying to separate the believer from their money. All right, that's the doctrine. What about the doom of false teachers? What's awaiting them? We're going to see that in uh, verses 4 to 6, they'll receive divine judgment. God is going to judge them. But the righteous will receive divine deliverance, verses 7 to 9. So God's going to treat them differently. Look at verses 4 through 6. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, or Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be received for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So let's stop there. Uh, verses 4 to 6, let's talk about the divine judgment on these false teachers. They are going to be judged. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, this would be talking about the angels who rebelled with Satan, right? God had to deal with them. We call them demon spirits, but they were angels who sinned. He cast them down to hell. Now, this is not the lake of fire. This is a particular word in the Greek. It's Tartarus. Uh, and it seems to be someplace in the middle of the earth. It's dark, it's dank, and they're in chains, and they're agonizing, and they're waiting for the day of judgment. Some believe that these are so bad that God will not allow them to come and trouble us. Sometimes I think God has allowed these fellows to get loose on me and you. But you know, if you do it from God's perspective, the, the little demon spirit who's bothering you probably is not a colonel or a lieutenant, probably is a corporal or a private. And uh, if he were to turn the big boys loose on you, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> so uh, these were so bad that he will not even allow them loose in this world to trouble the believers or the unbelievers. And they are there reserved for judgment. So the next time you're thanking God, think about this. Probably never thought about it. Lord, thank you that you're only allowing the 
lower echelon demon spirits to give me a hard time and give me the strength to resist them. Thank you that the big guns are not loose and not causing me to want to blow my brains out. They're reserved in Tartarus waiting for the final judgment. And then another example, the, the point he's making here is that God will judge. Verse 5, and he did not spare the ancient world from his judgment. He saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So God gave Noah the instructions to gather his family, and uh, that included his wife. She was number two, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the boys and their wives. That's uh, six more. That's eight, isn't it? Well, and then, of course, all the animals, two by two, plus animals uh, for animal sacrifice. Well, how long did that go on? How long did that boat take to finish? It took 120 years, and he was preaching the whole time. Now, I'm sure he was preaching by a hammer and a nail. I'm sure he was preaching by his faithfulness. Every day he got up and addressed that boat, and they had no idea what he was talking about, and he didn't really know what to expect either. They'd never had a flood like that before. So uh, he was there just uh, preaching by his actions. But I'm sure they asked the question, Noah, what are you doing? And I'm sure he must have said, God has told me to do this. Why? Because God's going to take care of sin. I'm sure he verbally, as well as in his actions, uh, testified about the judgment that's coming. And they laughed at him. They paid no attention to him whatsoever. Um, but he was a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. It's interesting that God in Leviticus, when he would want to cleanse something from sin, would go first with water, such as your garments, um, your bedding, um, and uh, equipment, anything that could be washed as a symbol of cleansing he would do. So washing was the first method. He washed the earth with a flood, bringing a new heaven and a new earth uh, in a sense. But the ultimate judgment has yet to come. And the flood didn't work, did it? So there's still sin. <laughs> we see poor Noah kind of celebrating getting through the, uh, the flood. And what does he do? He gets stinking drunk and he's totally naked and he's laying there and Ham makes fun of him and uh, gets cursed. Uh, Canaan, is his son, is the one that gets actually cursed. And so sin, sin abounds. And, oh, and uh, so did Noah sin. The next cleansing for the book of Leviticus, if water couldn't take care of it, what was next? Fire. Burn it. Well, the earth was not cleansed by water to the exclusion of sin. Next time it's going to be fire. Peter will talk about that. And uh, we'll cover that, uh, I think it's next week. He'll talk about uh, God totally and completely destroying this. Uh, he says, yes, in chapter 3, it says here that the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Verse 10, the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So he's going to burn it up. I was water baptized. It was a symbol of my faith in Christ. didn't cleanse me from sin. Water didn't cleanse me from sin, but fire does. John the Baptist said, referring to Jesus, there's one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to even unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. My mother used to say, Lord, turn the furnace of your fire up another hundred degrees and burn out of me all sin all that displeases you. So God knows how to deal with judgment. He took care of it with these angels, the bad angels, took care of it with the people in Noah's time, verse 5. Also in Sodom and Gomorrah, he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So he actually destroyed with fire Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham and his nephew Lot were so blessed by God. They had so many animals on the hoof. There wasn't enough grass. And Abraham said, we need to separate to feed the flocks. 
So you decide, you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. So Lot made a very bad mistake. He looked and down in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was fertile, it was green, it was lush, it looked beautiful. He said, I'll take that. So he did. Well, we don't know exactly what happened to him because by the time the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is coming, he no longer has any herd. He's living in town. He was living near it and now he's living in it. He's being tormented day and night. Uh, God, God sends angels down and the men try to have homosexual relations with him. Uh, and incidentally, homosexuality was a feature of the sins of that uh, area, but not the only ones. Certainly other sins as well. Every sin you can think of, no doubt, was, uh, no doubt was evident there as well. Well, God was able to turn those cities into ashes. He condemned them to destruction. And he made an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So today, you mention even to an unbeliever, watch out or your life will become like Sodom and Gomorrah. They might not agree with you, but they know what you're talking about. Sodom and Gomorrah to them is not a vacation spot. You know, going to Jamaica may be, and going to uh, St. Martin, uh, some of one of those places. Uh, but Sodom and Gomorrah, that speaks of destruction and uh, for the ungodly. But as God is doing that, he is delivering Lot. He delivers Lot, and he was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Every day he was suffering because of the wickedness of those around him. For that righteous man dwelling among them, he lived among them, he tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. It became very evident. He saw and he, uh, and, and he heard all their lawless deeds. So the Lord knows how to deliver the, un, to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So we see here that uh, uh, Noah is going to be going through the flood in that story. And that speaks to us, I think, of the future generation when just before the Lord's return, when the world is in tribulation, there'll be many Jews and some Christians who never heard the gospel, never got taken up in the rapture, they'll be protected. They're going to come to Christ and God will protect them. The 144,000 the Revelation talks about, he knows how to protect them, even though they will have to take the mark of the beast uh, to survive. Uh, the 144,000 won't take it, of course. But in order to buy and sell, can you imagine if you had to have that mark of the beast, 666, the name or the number of the beast? Uh, if not, you get killed. You starve to death. But God's going to preserve those who are his, who are faithful. He preserved Elijah during the difficult times when Ahab was king, along with Jezebel. So Noah becomes a picture of those who are going to live uh, and be protected through the tribulation after the church is taken out. But Lot is a picture of the church who is taken out before the Lord opens up uh, the tribulation time. And we'll be talking in Daniel about that, about the tribulation and the Antichrist uh, in the chapters uh, 7 and 8. I hope you can join us for that. Um, and oh, he was righteous, but he was tormented. And uh, we ought to be tormented as well. I think sometimes sin is just so commonplace for us. We, we hear it so much. I think it should bother us a lot more. Sometimes I have to pray, Lord, I'm not bothered enough by sin my own or somebody else's. Help me, Lord, to really be bothered by it, to grieve over it, to do all I can to pray against it, and in my case, to not indulge in it. I think we get too comfortable at times. Well, God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. We have a temptation. He knows how to deliver you. I have tried all my life to get rid of this temptation, and it doesn't work. Should I give up? No, Lord, you know how to deliver me. There is something. I've read books, I've seen videos, I've had testimonies, we might say, but it's not working for me. Go to God and say, what is the temptation that I'm dealing with and how do I get out of it? So he is the one who's your personal trainer and he'll show you how to be delivered from that temptation and then reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. He will keep the unjust for the judgment day. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority, 
They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels, who are greater in power and might, do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So we find here that the righteous are going to receive deliverance. But now these false teachers in verses 10 and 11, they're rebellious. They're rebellious. Look at verse 10. Especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. They indulge in lustful pleasures, fleshly pleasures. They despise authority. Whenever you see somebody who balks at authority, watch out. Probably that person is indulging in some real sinful practices, throwing off the authority of man, throwing off the authority of God. So he says now in verse 10, especially those who walk according to the flesh, in the lust of uncleanness, they despise authority. They're presumptuous. They're arrogant, prideful. They're self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. And dignitaries here would be the glorious ones, talking about angelic beings, good angels or even the evil angels. So who am I to speak evil of an angel? I think my angel is asleep sometimes. I shouldn't have been attacked. I shouldn't have had this problem. I think my angel is not the smartest angel up there. That's dangerous. I am no match for my angel. They are much more powerful than we are. They're wise. They're perfect. We're talking about here the good angels, I think. We need to speak with respect and thank God for them and take the blame. It's not the angel's fault that I did wrong. It's my fault that I did wrong. And thank you, angel, for having preserved me the number of times you did. The angels who are greater in power and might, they don't bring a reviling accusation against these other angels or even the the evil ones. Before the Lord, what do they say? Michael, Gabriel, if they're rebuking Satan, what do they say? The Lord rebuke you. They don't presume to say, I rebuke you. They're not equal with God. Maybe equal with the angel, with with Satan, but they say, the Lord rebuke you. That's why when you and I come against the devil, we don't say, I rebuke you, unless you add in the name of Jesus. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Leave me now in Jesus' name. Well, now we're going to look at the depravity of the false teachers. Look at verse 12. We're going to see how fleshly they are. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. So here they are, they're at fellowship socials, and um, they're, they're living for the devil. They are um, like brute beasts. Verse 12, they open their mouths. They speak evil of things they don't understand. They're critical of others. Ah, that preacher on television, he's a phony, this and that. That denomination, I think they ought to be hung. I think that's the worst denomination. I can't believe. And they have all these arrogant statements like that. We have to be careful about that. And so they love to carouse in the daytime, love to live for the flesh. Their spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. And uh, so they're, they're reveling. They're getting drunk. Uh, this was happening in Corinth when Paul had to address the matter of communion. They had fellowship socials. They brought their own food. They had wine. They had bread. And what did they do? The rich came in in some cases and began to pig out on their own food. I'm, I'm going to eat it first because there's some poor folks here And they have nothing to bring, and I'm not going to share it with them. And so they would just be selfish. Uh, They began to drink more than they should. Instead of drinking the wine to celebrate the blood of Jesus, or even just a little bit of a beverage, they get themselves stinking drunk. And he says this is a lousy testimony for the body and the blood of Christ. Well, it's worse. Verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery or literally of an adulteress, and they cannot cease from sin. They entice unstable souls. 
They have a heart trained in covetous practice and are accursed children. So we see in verse 12 that they um, speak evil of things they don't understand. They're filled with corruption and they're going to perish. They uh, receive wages of unrighteousness. They lift that offering as often as they can to get money for their pleasure. And um, they're carousing at the fellowship socials. They're checking out the members of the opposite sex or maybe the same sex, verse 14, full of adultery. And they just can't cease from sin. They're unstable. They have a heart trained in covetous practices, always trying to build money, always trying to get uh, green as the color for them, just more and more money. And they're really accursed children. Verse 15 tells us that uh, they're covetous. They have forsaken the right way. They've gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Interesting story if you go back into uh, Numbers and you'll see that this Balaam was a prophet. He was not a believer, but he did have a gift of prophecy at times. And uh, he was hired by uh, Balak, who I think was the king of Moab, to come and curse Israel because Israel was coming in near Moab and about to settle into the promised land. And Moab was afraid of Israel and wanted them to leave, afraid they'd overpower Moab. So they hired this prophet, Balaam, to curse them. Curse them. Well, he tried several times, didn't he? Tried about three times to curse Israel. God wouldn't do it. He opened his mouth and each time God brought forth a tremendous blessing because God loves Israel. God loves his children. And so um, Balaam had a problem. He wanted the money, but he wasn't successful. His prophecies were not working. So he was clever and he found another way. And so he said to the king of Moab, go ahead and worship your God, Peor, or Beor. Get your beautiful young ladies to invite the young Israelite men to come down and worship with them at the altars of Beor. And the way they would worship was to have sex. And so the young Jewish men would say, hey, 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 I like this party. And they would go down and they would have sex at the altar of Beor instead of worshiping God. God got so angry, he slew a large number of them. And Balaam accomplished through that deception what he couldn't through prophecies. So when at first you don't succeed, his motto was you keep on trying. So um, these false teachers have forsaken the right way. They've gone astray. They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, um, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Actually, the, the God was not Beor. That was the, the father. Um, Numbers 22. Let me get the, the name of that God. It's an interesting story. You might want to read that or preach on that sometime. And um, it's, a, it's a powerful story about how God uh, was angry because of their sin. And Balaam was just bent on uh, doing all he could to destroy them. Uh, it was Baal of Peor, chapter 25 of uh, the book of Numbers. You can read that on your own. And so they invited the uh, young Jewish men to come down and worship through sexual relations with the pretty young Moabite girls. God was angry and he killed them. And we can assume that Balaam got his money. That's all he wanted was the money. Verse 17, these false teachers just want the money also. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. When you go to a well on a hot day, you want water. How disappointed it becomes in your mind when you can't find water. Clouds that uh, don't bring any rain, just blown around by a tempest, uh, but they're, they're worthless, they're fruitless. And um, whatever we're involved with should produce. A well should produce water, 
Those clouds should produce rain. Well, God has a place for these false teachers, and it's reserved as the blackness of darkness forever. Is that a separate place for them? Or is it perhaps a description of the lake of fire? We think of the lake of fire, of course, burning with fire and brimstone. I think of it as being bright and fire and yellow and orange and so it may be. But at times or in certain locations, it could be blackness of darkness forever. The absence of Jesus. He is the light of the world. And so where he is, is light. And where he is not, is darkness. The world who is not following Christ is in darkness right now. Perhaps they're religious, maybe they're not. But if there are 7 billion people in this world, there are only about 2 billion who even claim that Jesus Christ is Lord. That includes 1.2 billion Roman Catholics who may not all be saved, but most of them do acknowledge at least that Jesus exists and is the Son of God. Not to mention the others who are not Catholic. But how about the rest of the people? 5 billion people. And so uh, they're in darkness right now. Who do they go to for their direction? Soothsayers? They go to, the, uh, to their friends? Internet? Uh, whatever it is, how do they get direction for their lives? And then finally, he said, uh, after the description of the false teachers, the deception, verses 18. Or let's pick it up with verse 17 again, on through verse 22. So they're, they're deceivers. They're wells without water. Clouds... Uh, with a tempest moving them around, nothing in them. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure the, through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in the error. So they use great swelling words. They're very articulate. They have the gift of gab, so to speak. When they speak these great swelling words of emptiness, they allure they draw you in through the lusts of the flesh. And they'll try to get you into sexual immorality and uh, into uh, making money and anything which is carnal. They're going to try to uh, prescribe for you. Lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error, they're going to try to bring them back in again. Those who barely escaped, they finally got rid of those evil practices and then these teachers get a hold of them and drag them back in again. They go after them and drag them back in. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Oh, they say you're gonna be, you'll be free, but they're slaves of depravity. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So when someone or something overcomes you, you are brought into bondage or slavery by that thing. Well, I have that addictive behavior, but I can stop at any time I want to. Try it. Try it. Not so easy, is it? It can be done. There are those who've done it even without the Lord, through incredible willpower, but that doesn't gain any spiritual development for them. God wants us to come to Him and say, I will set you free. You'll be free, but you'll also grow in faith and experience with me. And um, so they are dragging you back in again. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. So those who have been delivered from lust and pride and power and, and uh, uh, amassing money for the sake of amassing it, all those things, these teachers appeal to them, they drag them back in again, they begin to pick up the same sins they once had. Now this latter end is worse for them. Just as he uses an example here about the uh, dog returns to his own vomit. Not a very pretty picture, is it? 
And so it's not a very pretty picture of us to be set free by the Lord. And then once we're free, we go back into it again. It's like a dog lapping up its own vomit. Or that sow having washed, wallowing in the mire. Give the sow a nice bath, put a nice red ribbon around its neck, and it goes right back into the mud again, doesn't it? And that's a picture of us as we are freed by the Lord, and then we go back into those sinful practices once again. And then these false teachers say, that's okay. God understands. He knows that you're human. He knows you can't live in righteousness. And so they will deceive us and tell us that it's okay with God to do that. Well, this is an uh, interesting chapter. It's the Christian's warning. And I think uh, to avoid false teachers, as I said before, we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to his word. I'm reminded of the bank. I have to go to the bank tomorrow morning and um, I'll give some bills from the deposit. And uh, the uh, young lady there, whoever she is, will handle those bills. They also put them through the machine too, but she'll handle those bills. Um, she knows the touch of a false bill versus the true. How does she know? She never took a course in false bills. They don't have a stack of false bills over here and true bills here. What do they do? Just keep handling the genuine. They just keep handling the genuine. And if there's a counterfeit, they can spot it like that. Well, so it is with the Lord. If we'll handle his word, get into it every day, if somebody gets up there and makes a statement that is false, bing, like my late mother, the, the bell went off in her head. She said, I don't know, something's not right. Honey, can you help me out? And I said, yep, that is not right. That is deceptive. So we need to be clear in our minds to handle the genuine article. Get into God's word every day. And most importantly of all, be with Jesus every day. He is the living word. The Bible is the written word. Live in Jesus live in his word, you'll be safe. Amen? Let's bow our hearts. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have studied your word. Help us, Lord, to be aware of false teaching, that we don't say anything which is not true, and we don't allow somebody else to pollute our minds. We wouldn't allow someone to ring our doorbell, open the door, and dump their trash on our nice new carpet. Don't let somebody come in and dump trash on us with false teaching, sinful teaching. Help us, Lord, to be able to be steadfast, lovingly to guard the truth for the benefit and welfare of the saints. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. He's passing by this moment. Oh,